Yes, everyone. Bonjour de Paris. Hello from Paris. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I am thrilled to be with you at the Ruth Keeler Memorial Library. I wish we could be there in person, but maybe another time when it's safe. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my book, The Paris Library. It's World War II. Paris is occupied. There's a war on words. It's Nazis versus librarians, and the librarians win. The Paris Library tells the true tale of the courageous librarians who defied the Nazis in order to hand deliver books to Jewish readers. I first learned about this story when I worked at the American Library in Paris as the program's manager. I organized weekly author events and learned so much from each writer. It was really a wonderful job. Um, this year, the American Library in Paris celebrates its centennial. In 1917, when the US entered World War I, the American Library Association distributed 2 million books to soldiers in camp libraries and hospitals. The Paris Library, as it was called then, was just a depot for books. But people in Paris wanted to create an enduring library. Now it is the largest English language lending library on the continent, and over 60 nationalities are represented in its membership. In my novel, my character Odile is named after the Parisian bookseller Odile Hellier. At the age of 40, she started the Village Voice bookshop on Rue Princesse, Princess Street, where she, um, she sold uh, books in English uh, and she, books she loved for 30 years. And I will always be grateful for her support. So that's where the name Odile came from in my book. And in the Paris library, Odile, the character is fictitious, but her colleagues are real. And first I'd like to tell you about my favorite, Dorothy Reader. Isn't that a great name for a librarian? After working at the Library of Congress, she came to Paris alone in 1929. She started in the periodical section and worked her way up to the role of directress. After the war, she spent two years training librarians in Bogota, Colombia. She also raised funds for the Red Cross in Florida. In the 1940s, Dorothy Reeder worked on three continents. She's simply amazing. Second, the head librarian Boris Nechayev is originally from Russia. When he was 15, Boris lied about his age and enrolled in the army in order to fight in the Russian Revolution. He and his brother moved to Paris, hoping to find peace, but instead found themselves in the middle of another war. Third, the Countess from Ohio. Clara de Chambrun, an American who married a French count, was one of the original trustees of the American Library in Paris, along with Edith Wharton. During World War II, the Countess was 70 years old. She was so worried about the library that she actually slept on a mattress there to keep watch. In the summer of 1939, librarians, like all Parisians, carried gas masks. To prepare for war, the librarians posted, pasted brown strips of paper on windows as protection against shattered glass in case of bombing. The US Embassy advised Americans to leave France. Dorothy Reeder and her staff remained. Three days after war was declared, the directors created the soldier service. Staff sent books to military hospitals and canteens, but their point of pride was in care packages to individual soldiers. From September of 1939 to May 1940, the library sent 100,000 books to French and English soldiers. In June of 1940, three days after the Germans took over Paris, the Nazis invaded the Polish library, which sits in the shadow of Notre Dame, and they stole the books and archives. A few weeks later, the Nazis pillaged the collection of the Russian library, then the Ukrainian library. They even abducted the librarian. So you can understand why the staff at the American Library was nervous. Boris, the head librarian, was shot by the Gestapo and taken to be interrogated. Without the quick intervention of the Countess, Boris would have died. I interviewed his daughter, who was in the next room when he was shot through the lung. Hélène said that Boris made a full recovery. He went on to smoke packs of his beloved Jeton cigarettes, and he worked at the library until he retired. Dorothy Reeder, Boris Nechayev, and the Countess Claire de Chambrun are the heart, soul, and life of the library. 
I hope you'll enjoy reading about their stories. I'd like to show you a few pictures of them now. So I'm going to screen share. Let me see, I'm not... There we go, thank you for your patience. There we go, can everyone see? Yes, I think we can. Oh, good. There we go. So here is a cover of, of my book, The Paris Library. I think this, I think this, um, I think this photo is taken from Notre Dame. I think that's the, um, if you're looking where this photo was taken, it's taken from Notre Dame. I think they climbed up the steps and they and they took the photo from there. This is the um, I think this is the um, medical university, like the um, medical school. So here we are inside the American Library in Paris today. It is the largest English language lending library on the European continent. It has 4,000 members representing 60 countries. It celebrated its centennial in 2020. About 22% of the members are French. And if we were doing this, um, if we were doing this event in person, um, I think I, I would be talking at the same time as showing. So this time I did my, my talk and now I'm, I'm, I'm showing the pictures a little later. So in its current location, the American Library sits in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. And this is a photo taken from my first day at work at the library as the programs manager. So this is the inner courtyard. It's kind of a secret courtyard. You need to have a code to get inside. And this is the back entrance. So when you work in the back office, this is how you went to the library. Some of my favorite authors when I worked there were Lionel Shriver, uh, who I got to interview. She wrote the book, um, so, um, we need to talk about Kevin. And I also like Tatiana Derone, who wrote Sarah's Keith. She was just such a gracious, gracious um, guest. So I feel really lucky that um, I got to interview so many and, and um, welcome so many, so many authors each week. Now, this is the library in 1939. It's on the other side of the river. Um, and staff comes from the US, Canada, Russia, France, Switzerland, and England. Our story starts here. I want you to remember this picture because we're going to see it again in a minute. This is an information card of the American Library in Paris. And I think what's interesting about it is that it only has four phone digits. And um, I don't know when you went to six or eight or 10 digits. In Montana, when I was growing up, we still had uh, we still had the four digits, 2669 was our phone number. So um, it was interesting to see that here too, there were four digits. Uh, this uh, was one of my first finds online and it was really, this photo was the inspiration for one of my characters. You can see that this is the same photo. I bought this photo from the Chicago Tribune archive. They went on sale. And when I saw this picture of the American Library in Paris, you can believe I snapped it right up. So this is, this photo is the inspiration for my character, Margaret. I love the wide brim of her hat and I wonder what secret she's hiding. If you've already read the book, you know that there at one point in the book, Margaret sweeps into the library and she's wearing um, all white and it really annoys one of my other characters. If you've read the book too, you can see that I talk about the pebbled path that leads up to the library. You can, you can see that there are pansies or maybe petunias as well. Later on, there's a, a mention of the urn of ivy. So you can see a lot of the things um, stay traditional. I will say that this is the actual entrance of the library. But when I first started writing that, I didn't know that. My first view of the library was really this information card. And so that's why I, I prefer to have this as the entrance. So here we are in August, 1939 with war on the way and the US ambassador advised, in view of the situation prevailing in Europe, it is advisable that American citizens return to the US. 
uh, he put this in letters to American citizens, and it was also um, printed in the newspaper, the, um, the New York Herald, the Paris edition. So they really did get the news out, and they really did want people to go home. So this is uh, Miss Reader, the directress, and the cataloger, Mrs. Turnbull, Evangeline Turnbull from Canada, who are putting important papers away in the, in the safe. Here we have a staff member making care packages for soldiers. They were English, French, and Czech soldiers, and they also sent books to the French Foreign Legion. Boris's brother uh, joined the French Foreign Legion, and sadly, he died just a few days before the war ended. Uh, the um, record for wrapping a care package was one minute and 40 seconds, and I love that they actually keep track of that. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from the directress, Miss Reader. She says that no other thing possesses that mystical faculty to make people see with other people's eyes. The library is a bridge of books between cultures. And I just, I really love that idea uh, and that image of books as, as bridges. From September 1939 to May of 1940, a total of 100,000 books were sent. And um, if you'll notice, they have baskets, not trolleys. So everything that they had, they carried. That was something that really surprised me. I thought, I thought there had been trolleys to transport books forever, but they, I mean, all the archive pictures, they're all these, these wicker baskets. Here we have Nazis who have arrived in, in Paris already. And here we have one of my favorite photos of Dorothy Reader. I found this photo on eBay for $24.99. And it just astounds me that our, our past or our memories or um, our history is just floating along, floating along online for sale. Uh, Dorothy Reader worked at the Library of Congress, as I mentioned, um, and she moved to Paris on her own uh, for, in 1929. Before that, she went to Spain for a few weeks to help create the Library of Congress uh, information stand at the Iberian Fair. On June 12, 1940, just before the Nazis invaded Paris, Miss Reader sent her own staff away for their safety, but she remained at her post. The directress dealt with Dr. Fuchs, the Nazi library protector. The Nazis had pillaged the Russian and Polish libraries in Paris. Certain people may not enter the library, he stated, meaning Jewish people. But Miss Reader and her colleagues hand deliver books to the Jewish members. It's interesting to note that Miss Reader was very nervous when she received word that the, the bibliotheque shoots the the library protector was going, was on his way. Um, he recognized her when he saw her. They had been colleagues and um, had, had been very cordial at international library conferences. And all of a sudden they found themselves on opposite sides. Here's Miss Reader again, and I think she looks different in every single photo. Here, this is a photo of her in her office, and you can see um, this is a photo of Washington, D.C. here. I also love the huge telephone that we can that we can see here. And I think in every photo she um, every photo we see of her, she looks a little bit different. We'll see a third photo of her, and, and you can see if you agree with me or, or not. So Miss Reader and the Countess Claire de Chambrun um, were really vital in keeping uh, the library open during World War II. Claire de Chambrun, as I said earlier, was one of the original trustees along with Edith Wharton, the writer and the millionaire Anne Morgan. During World War II, she was the only trustee to remain in Paris. The others returned to the safety of the States. That's not a judgment I'm sure I would have returned to, but I do admire her courage in staying. She also had trouble with the Nazi library protector. She was summoned to his office because the American library in Paris had been denounced because its collection contained anti-German journals and political cartoons. So he uh, interrogated the, um, the Countess. She was accompanied by her secretary. In the book, I have Odile, my character, accompany her. Um, but in, in real life, it was her secretary, uh, Miss Frickert. And uh, the Nazi library protector said that as long as she made sure that uh, no other uh, anti-German journals or political cartoons were dispersed in the collection, he would not take action. 
This is a photo of Claire de Chambrun at her home near the Luxembourg Garden. I found this uh, online as well and, and bought it when I saw it. She was a very interesting lady as well. She earned a PhD from the Sorbonne at the age of 48. So that, um, that would be really challenging to learn uh, to have a PhD in a foreign language. And she was a Shakespeare scholar as well as a novelist. She uh, shared a publisher with, with Hemingway, uh, Scribner, her, um, you can read about her war experiences in her memoir, Shadows Lengthen. She also translated Shakespeare's work into French. This is Boris Nechayev, and he started at the library as a page in 1925, and he worked his way up to head librarian. Originally from Russia, he spoke several languages. During the occupation, he was shot, and the Gestapo took him prisoner. He survived and worked at the library until he retired. Here he's holding his daughter, Hélène, in his arms. And I was thrilled to be able to interview her for the book. She's in her 80s now. And you'll, you'll see that there's the photo of the library that you saw earlier um, in, in the PowerPoint. And you can see here that um, this is where he is standing. And then um, kindly shared her photos, her family photos with me. So this is a family photo. She said that she spent a lot of time at the library and that the librarians were always very glad to see her. His son also worked at the library as a teenager and uh, they read my book in English, which was very brave of them. And they said that I'd captured the atmosphere of the library and the spirit of their father, which made me very happy. So this is a staff photo of the American Library in Paris. And you'll see it is a photo taken by Harcourt. Harcourt is a, is a um, photography company which usually takes photos of movie stars like Catherine Deneuve or Gérard Depardieu. So it's especially nice to see that they took the, the uh, photo of these librarians. So this is Dorothy Reader. And do you think she looks different in these photos than in other photos? I, I, I do think she looks um, quite different in every single photo. Here we have Boris again, and he always he always looks the same to me. It's very interesting. At the library, none of us are on a first name basis with Miss Reader or the Countess. They are always Miss Reader or the Countess. But Boris is always Boris, and I don't know why that is. I asked his children, and they said that even though he was from a noble family, he, he made sure that everyone was at ease, and he was just someone that people would line up to, to visit with at the circulation desk. I could have, I think my book is maybe, I don't know, maybe 370 pages. I could have made it 1,070 pages because the characters are so interesting. This is a mother-daughter uh, librarian team. So here we have, um, in the front row, we have Evangeline Turnbull. She married her husband, Captain Turnbull, in uh, 1916 before he shipped off to war. Um, he was killed. Um, he was killed in France on the battlefield, um, and just a little while later, his daughter Olivia was born. And so you have Captain Turnbull, who served in World War One in France, and then you have his widow and his daughter, who are serving the library, sending books to soldiers in World War Two. So this is really an incredible Canadian family. So we have the library love story. We have Helen um, Fickweiler and Peter Ustinov. And uh, they fell in love at the library. Helen Fickweiler is a, from Rhode Island and she arrived three, day, three weeks before war broke out. Um, and she, um, just like Peter, decided to stay. I was able to interview their daughter and, and granddaughter which was, which was really, really lovely. I really enjoyed that. Um, two weeks ago, we got word about another librarian. Um, I'm just gonna, can you see my mouse? I'm going to run it on her face. Can you see? So this is Jeanette Etlinger King, and we didn't know what happened to her. And I don't bring her up in the book at all, but she was a Jewish librarian. And for a long time, we've been very worried about her because she disappeared without a trace. And we found her just recently in um, an article um, in Foreign Affairs. She was taken prisoner in Germany in Baden-Baden with her husband, um, Hubert King, who was a journalist, an English journalist. And so they were held prisoners um, apart with the journalists and the, 
um, and the diplomatic corps. And so the first thing Jeanette did as a librarian um, in this prison was to create a library. And at first the, the library was books that they had um, of their own, but she expanded the collection to 1,200 books by the time the war was over. And we know that she returned safely to the States and then she divorced her, that she and her husband divorced. So we wondered if maybe he married her to keep her safe, to give her a different last name. We don't know, but I was very happy to find out what happened to her. And this is just to say that even though even though I finished this book in, in, two, in 2019 and it's sold in 2019, I finished editing it in 2019, but I'm still very concerned about these characters. And I, um, I, I've still been researching them. I've still been looking after them. If you check out a book from the American Library in Paris, you'll see this book plate, the American Library in Paris, um, from the darkness of war, the light of books. And so you can see that a book is wide as a horizon and you can see kind of the sun rising from the, from the book and you can see that the, the book is somehow victorious over the, over the sword and, and, and the rifle, which I think is a really lovely image. And here we have uh, the, the Paris Library again with an old fashioned card and a stamp on it, which I think is really nice. So um, I'll just continue a little bit. Um, and then if you have questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. My novel is set in Paris and in Montana, where I grew up. I lived in Shelby, Montana, population 2000. My parents, who are here tonight, along with my sister and our friend Cheryl, um, were farmers. And we were landlocked by wheat fields. But the land was very flat. And you could see 100 miles in any direction. And it really gave me a sense of limitless possibilities. In Shelby, our neighbor was Claudine Maynard, a war bride. She was originally from the city of Rouen, not far from the D-Day beaches in Normandy. She married a GI and traveled with him to the States. When Madame Maynard spoke English, she made it sound so beautiful with her lilting accent. Along with jigsaw puzzles that featured images of Dutch tulip fields, she was really the only hint to the outside world we had. Spending time with Madame Maynard really made me want to speak French, learn French at school, and then go to France. I should also say that another thing that really inspired me growing up was my family. Um, my grandmother loved to read, but she couldn't drive. So once a week, my mother would drive her to the grocery store and to the library, which of course growing up made me realize that books are just as nourishing as food. Um, I came to Paris for one year um, as a teacher, a uh, teaching assistant. The French government had a, had a, um, had a program where um, young people who had just recently graduated from college could work in a local school. And so I did that for one year. And I liked it so much I renewed my contract. And then I met my husband, and that's a long-term contract. And so I've been here for about 20 years now. Um, in terms of themes, I'm really interested in the shock of cultures, not just French in America, but small town versus big city. My character Odile did not have an easy time in a small town, just like my war bride Nader probably struggled with homesickness and maybe having to recreate her identity. I know that when I was younger, I was dying to get to a big noisy city where I could be anonymous and no one would know my business. And now of course I miss Montana, the calm, the silence, the quiet beauty, the way people care for each other, exactly the same reasons I wanted to leave. Like my character, Lily, who feels like she is living reruns of Little House on the Prairie while the rest of the world watches MTV. I didn't always realize what I had and I wish I'd appreciated things a bit more but maybe this year we see things a little bit differently. Um, to finish up, I'll say that this novel is a love letter to libraries and to bookstores, to the people who defend books and to promote reading. And it's a reminder that in the digital age, our libraries, our third space, our sanctuary, our source of facts in a fake news world are more vital than ever. And I think that the Paris Library is a reminder that we have to protect what we have. So um, thank you for coming along this evening. Um, and I hope that you'll check out my novel and that you'll enjoy spending time in the Paris Library.